Good morning, everyone. So um, welcome back. So the title of our panel is the 75th anniversary of the Nuremberg Judgment, the Academy and War Crimes Prosecutions. So this is a really broad topic because basically the whole field of international law, um, a, a field of international justice is the legacy of the Nuremberg Tribunal and the Nuremberg Tribunal Judgment. Because we don't really know that if, if we never had the Nuremberg Tribunal, would we even have had the Yugoslav Rwanda Tribunals, Special Court for Sierra Leone, Cambodia Tribunal, International Criminal Court? So those of us speaking and teaching and writing in this field, we, we basically owe our jobs, our livelihoods, I think, to the Nuremberg Tribunal. So this was an incredible um, moment. I'll have to think deeply, Michael, if that's a Groshen moment. Um, uh, but it, it, it certainly is a pivotal moment um, for the field. So each of our panelists is going to talk about some of their work in the field of international justice. Um, and um, so I think their bios have been posted somewhere. So I'm just going to briefly um, introduce the panelists. So um, first, um, I will turn to Professor Leila Sadat. She is James Carr Professor of International Criminal Law at Washington University School of Law. She also serves as Special Advisor on Crimes Against Humanity to the International Criminal Court Prosecutor. And congratulations to Leila on your recent reappointment under the new prosecutor. She is currently also a senior researcher, research scholar at Yale Law School, working on a book on crimes against humanity. And um, you might have noted in my arguments when I was talking about treaty obligations, I couldn't even mention a crime against humanity treaty because there isn't one. And this may come as a real surprise to those in the audience because, of course, it was prosecuted at Nuremberg. So, Leila, help us understand how could we have crimes against humanity prosecuted 1945, 1946, and there is no um, treaty. There actually isn't a U.S. law on crimes against humanity. Uh, what has happened and what are your thoughts? Can this treaty get finalized? Can it come to fruition? Thank you so much, Jennifer, and thank you again uh, to Dean Michael Scharf for the invitation to be here and to see for the first time in 18 months uh, in person so many friends and colleagues. Um, so why don't we have a treaty on crimes against humanity and what is the origin of that? Since this panel is called the Academy, right, the Academy and in International Law, that's our conference, and we're talking about Nuremberg, the question is really what do academics have to do with uh, norm creation, norm entrepreneurship, and how do they intersect with the behavior of states and the creation of international law? And I think the last panel gave us a lot of food for thought on that. Crimes Against Humanity has an ancient pedigree in some ways, and yet it's in positive law of recently modern vintage. Um, Beth von Scock actually has written a wonderful article on this in the African Journal of International Criminal Justice, finding references that I didn't know were out there about crimes against humanity uh, in the 19th century being used to describe slavery in the slave trade. And even prior to that, there were references um, about the laws of humanity. And you'll see in the Martin's Clause that I think it was... Um, uh, Dean Scharf mentioned, uh, references to the dictates of the public conscience and the laws of humanity. And so one of the things that we have to remember going a little bit deeper into international legal theory um, than we have evoked thus far, which is you have treaties and you have customary international law, is that international law has a big natural law uh, history. And when we talk about natural law, it's disfavored these days in this era of positivism where we're going to look only at specific rules and bind states to those. But you can't have a legal system unless the actors within the legal system have certain norms that actually give rise to the legal system itself, right? And so one of the great chicken and egg problems of international law is are states making the rules? Are states creating the rules? Or do the rules create 
create states and do the rules create a backdrop against which states have to measure their behavior? And the answer is probably there's a blend of both, which is you don't have an entirely positivistic system because you always have rules of general application that apply even outside the four corners of any particular treaty or even outside the notions of customary international law. And those ideas are ancient. They go back to Roman times. You can find them in the writings of Grotius. You find them in the codification and the preamble of the Martin's Clause of the 1907 Hague Convention. And you find them at Nuremberg. And at Nuremberg, which is maybe one of those, if we want to use the term Grotian moments, or one of the moments at which international law is faced with um, um, so much evidence of atrocity and harm that it says our rules just aren't working anymore. And Nuremberg, in a sense, was a response to the atrocities of that war. Not just the Holocaust. Unfortunately, Nuremberg itself didn't focus as much on the persecution of the Jews, on the extermination of Jewish and other minorities. It focused a lot on aggressive war as uh, Jennifer Trahan has already told us. But I think in that case, my mentor Sharif used to like to say the facts drove the law. And there was so much uh, atrocity and devastation everywhere and that the entire international community looked at this and said, you know, humanity cannot survive doing this again, because if we don't fix what we've been doing, we'll destroy ourselves. And that notion is old. It goes back to Grotius. It goes to Vettel. It goes to many of the great thinkers that saw outside the four corners of specific treaties, outside the, the codifications and customary international law, certain norms that were fundamental to the existence of the system itself right? And crimes against humanity is one of those norms. Crimes against humanity was uh, written down, they, they attribute it to Hirsch Lauder Pact, having placed it in Article 6C of the Nuremberg Charter. And it is the time at which we date sort of the first codification. We had this murder, extermination, deportation, all these things against a civilian population were crimes, even if committed in uh, accordance with the domestic law of the country um, that the individuals coming from committed them. And the other thing about crimes against humanity at Nuremberg is it got us around this problem that the laws of war only applied to essentially what a state did to the nationals of another state. It had interstate effect, but it didn't have intrastate effect. And so the codification of crimes against humanity got not only at what the Germans and the other members of the Axis powers were doing to countries under their occupation, but to their own people. And crimes against humanity then is one of those moments, whether we call it Groschen or something else, where you see a fundamental shift in international law. That said, it was predicated on the work of scholars and on the work of diplomats. It had a long pedigree uh, that we can trace back into early days, and it was individuals writing, talking, thinking, putting those ideas into the, the groundwater, if you like, that unfortunately it took a crisis of global proportions for them to crystallize at that time into a norm of international law. Following the Nuremberg judgment, Unfortunately, uh, we had codification of genocide, which was a crime named by a very famous individual called Ralph, Raphael Lemkin, for the students in the room. They may not have heard of Lemkin, but he came up with the idea that this crime of killing the members of a group just because they were born members of that group had to have a name. And the name he gave it was genocide, exterminating or attempting to destroy the members of a group specifically just, and this is sort of a French idea, just because they were born. They were born into that group. Um, that's very different in a way than the way we've come to know crimes against humanity, fast forwarding 75 years, and I don't have time to go into it. But the idea of genocide, that is the persecution or the destruction of groups, is a very different idea than widespread or systematic uh, atrocities commit 
committed against individuals. And it's maybe Philippe Sands, who's most recently articulated this so beautifully in his book, East West Street, where he talks about genocide being the destruction of groups, crimes against humanity really being widespread or systematic campaigns against individuals. And so for a crime against humanity, you don't need to limit the attack to a racial, religious, national, or ethnic group the way you do for genocide. It can be any group or no group at all, right? A state could just randomly decide we're going to torture every 50th person or every person with red or brown hair uh, just to make a point, and those would be crimes against humanity. They wouldn't be genocide. And so today, we don't have an international treaty. I'll just let this sit with you for a minute. We have no international treaty that condemns the mass extermination of human beings at all. We have no treaty on this. We have one treaty called the Genocide Convention that only covers mass extermination in the case of four groups if there's an intent to destroy those groups. And proving that is virtually impossible. And so one of the gaping holes left over from Nuremberg is we have no treaty on crimes against humanity. My mentor, Sharif Basuni, wrote about this in 1994. He said, states are shockingly complacent about this. We also have no treaty that condemns mass deportation, that condemns sexual and gender-based violence. Nothing. Zero. We only do it if there's a war. And we know that by the time war breaks out, everything has really gone to heck in a handbasket, right? And so so if you care about prevention, the way Jennifer Trahan uh, spoke in her uh, intervention this morning, if you care about prosecution, you really need an instrument on crimes against humanity. And we don't have one. So um, as part of the academy, uh, having read about this, thought about this, been inspired by my mentor, Sharif Basuni, who chaired the drafting committee in Rome for the ICC statute, I said, when I took over the Harris Institute uh, in 2007, let's write one. And let's see if we can get the world to sign on to this. So there is a global treaty now on crimes against humanity that came out of our project. It was then picked up up by the United Nations International Law um, Commission, which uh, is diplomats, essentially. It's not all, many members of foreign ministries sit as members of the ILC, but I don't know if they would uh, qualify as Omri's definition of diplomats. But uh, as I said to him, I think international law is probably too important to be left to, to states, actually, uh, although we need states to, to cooperate with it. And the International Law Commission spent another six years working on crimes against humanity and came up with a set of draft articles that it presented to the General Assembly Six Committee, that's their legal committee in 2019. And unfortunately, even though by most estimates between about 70 and 100 states support this quite actively, um, they weren't able to take action in 2019. Austria offered to host a diplomatic conference. A whole group of states were ready to sign on. And alas, because the ILC draft had been deposited fairly late in the process, they got it in August, the meetings were in late September, many states said, we're just not quite ready. There was a little timidity. One could suspect other moments, but motives, but let's just say that's where we were. States were unwilling to go uh, immediately into negotiation of a treaty. And then when it rolled over to 2020, we found ourselves in the midst of a pandemic where meetings couldn't even take place in person, or if they were in person, they were very very short, with no opportunities for the kind of informal negotiations that sometimes seem to have to happen in order for international law to take place. And so one of the things that is different about our time now in 2021 and 2020 with the pandemic that well, there are two things that are very different than 1994 when the International Law Commission presented the General Assembly with the draft statute for an international criminal court. One is we're in the middle of a global pandemic still that's having very uneven effects all over the globe. And we're... Um, really having trouble getting anything done uh, in international law, no less uh, a sort of edgy new crimes against humanity convention, right? And the other thing is the world has really changed. And I don't know if we'll talk about this at all uh, during the course of the, the day, but I contributed to a project called, you know, the decline of the international 
liberal legal order uh, recently. I tried to argue we weren't totally in decline, but there's no doubt that in 1994, we were in something that the General Assembly called the decade of international law. We had seen the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989. There was a new resurgence and hope in international law as a problem-solving device. The General Assembly was very active. You weren't seeing vetoes from China and Russia on major issues. They were fairly quiescent, especially um, the Russian Federation, which had, you know, been the the former Soviet Union just five years earlier. And so we didn't have the kind of structural obstacles at the level of the Security Council and the General Assembly that we have today. I think in the 1990s, we would not have seen 16 vetoes in the Syria situation. And now here we are in 2021, the great powers are if not at each other's throats. And sometimes if you read the travaux of the Security Council, right, the, 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 the proceedings are published and you can see the delegates practically yelling at each other in the Security Council. Um, we are at a very fractious and difficult moment in international law where I think there's a lot of contestation about norms. There, we're in the, not, in the, not just in the midst of a pandemic movement, but a movement by the Global South to demand um, the enforcement of norms against discrimination and wealth equality and poverty. And so we're at a, a very difficult time, I think, in international law globally, and that's making the negotiation of this particular convention, I think, even more difficult um, because states in the global south are preoccupied with other issues. You have two now, you had three, but two of the five permanent members of the Security Council sort of behaving often as spoilers in, I don't know how else to say that, but essentially as spoilers in international law. And you had the United States over the past four years, that's shifted now, um, but you had the United States basically coming in and saying America first, and we really don't care what the rest of the international community is doing. And so that even splintered, if you like, the WEOG alliance, the Western and others weren't acting as a block. The United States kind of had its perspective, and then other states like France and the UK had uh, their perspective. So now we have um, a happier situation slightly. The pandemic is easing up a little bit. The, um, the United States has come back to multilateralism, although we still don't have a legal advisor for the State Department. And I think on this particular convention, the US wouldn't take the lead anyway. And it might be better if it didn't, because it's not seen as really necessarily positive in the area of peace and security in terms of nor entrepreneurship. Um, and so we have a coalition of states, mostly European, but a couple African, some from Latin America, a um, couple Asian, who are uh, trying to come up with a, um, a concrete strategy to get this out of the sixth committee, which operates by consensus. So any state can block motion forward in the sixth committee and into the general assembly, uh, perhaps into to an ad hoc committee, just as the um, ICC statute was transferred from the Sixth Committee to the General Assembly for the negotiation of a new treaty. So I'm very proud as an academic of having used a lot of my time <laughs> to, to elaborate this, to draft it, to work on some of the tricky issues, right? It's not as if it was uh, easy to draft or... Um, completely obvious at the beginning why we might need such a new treaty. I think as the process went forward, it became more evident how useful a new convention could be. You know, uh, Gambia versus Myanmar probably wouldn't be a genocide case. It would be a crimes against humanity case if we had a crimes against humanity treaty. And you wouldn't have distinguished scholars fighting about whether they intended to exterminate the Rohingya or just ethnically cleanse and kill lots of them, right? Which is an un seemly conversation to have in any event. Uh, and it's, uh, it's distracting us from the real issue of 900,000 people living in refugee camps in Bangladesh, uh, and who were, uh, by all accounts, um, uh, terribly treated and subjected to atrocity crimes in Myanmar. So I hope that's helpful. I think maybe I should stop there. I don't see the little sign, but um, I yield my time to the next person and maybe we'll have more time for discussion afterwards. Thank Great. you. Thank you so much, Leila, for those remarks. And also, I mean, just to acknowledge your tremendous work inspired by Sharif, but for the students in the audience, you know, one person really can make a difference by deciding to drive a convention forward um, as a professor. And it's quite remarkable, honestly. So um, 
I will now turn to Timothy Webster, who is professor of law at Western New England. Oh, we didn't give Layla a round of applause because oh. I started talking too soon. <laughs> um, professor Webster is professor of law at Western New England School of Law. He was formerly professor of transnational law, director of Asian legal studies, and co-founder of the joint program in international commercial law here at Case Western Reserve School of Law. So those of you who have studied in the field of international justice under Dean Michael Scharf or Professor Jim Johnson will know of the parallel tribunal to the Nuremberg Tribunal, the International Military Tribunal for the Far East, known as the Tokyo Tribunal. So we're going to shift now to the Asian theater, and I welcome Tim's discussion of his ongoing litigation efforts in Asia to see compensation, apology, and other forms of satisfaction for World War II crimes. Tim. Great. Thank you. Um, is, this, is this on? Yeah. OK, yeah. great. Um, so of course, it's wonderful to be back here at uh, Case Western. I've been gone for a couple of years, uh, and I'm glad that Michael Scharf uh, was generous enough to invite me. I twisted his arm a little bit. but. Uh, he, he was very gracious, as you would expect uh, Dean Scharf to be. And of course, it's wonderful to be among old friends uh, here at the table. Um, I'm a bit more of an observer. Um, Layla is obviously a participant. Uh, um, Beth and Michael, my, um, uh, my, my co-panelists here, and of course, Jennifer, have played a really active role in promoting uh, various treaties and, and other ways. Tim, uh, you might need to get closer to your mic. Yeah, I, I don't Because okay. we're live streaming. Got it. Thank you. I will... Um, I'll see what I can do here. Um, can I try your mic? I'll be like a CNN reporter. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see here. Mike, does yours have a green light? Yeah. Okay. Is that green? Yeah. Cool. Fabulous. Um, is this any better? And, and be honest with me. Yeah. That's great. Fabulous. Thank you. Okay. Um, so uh, without further ado, and, and I'm glad um, uh, for Jennifer's introduction, A, because she framed it as an issue of international justice. And of course, most of the people in, in this conference are talking about international criminal law, which has been a, a main driver. Um, but civil litigation also plays a really important role in addressing and, um, and redressing crimes against humanity um, and, and other uh, atrocities committed during World War II. And, and people in this country are probably familiar with the Holocaust litigation from the 1990s and 2000s in the United States and various European states. That was one iteration of this move away, just to, to cite what Leila, uh, Leila was talking about, when it comes to the harm that was actually done, for example, to Jewish people uh, during the war. Um, a similar indifference, I think, has characterized um, suffering in Korea, suffering in China, uh, other parts of Asia as well. Well, and it's not really until the last 30 years that um, civil litigation has taken up the call to uh, demand compensation, to demand apologies, to demand some kind of accountability, both from the Japanese government and from dozens of Japanese corporations that used forced labor during World War II. Right? So um, what I'm going to do in my brief presentation is A, outline this socio-legal movement uh, where um, victims and activists and lawyers and epistemic communities have um, mobilized for this issue of seeking compensation for the war. Um, I'll then talk about a couple of the key roles that academics play uh, in, in this movement. Um, I had planned to do uh, some introductions of uh, whom I think to be the, the, the key figures. I think that's a little bit better when there's slides and pictures and stuff like that. So in the absence of that, maybe I'll, I'll, um, I'll shorten that part of my uh, presentation um, and uh, we can take it up in the Q&A or during coffee afterwards. So um, let me begin just by uh, offering up civil litigation as a tool to redress war era crimes, uh, crimes against humanity and, and other compensation issues. Um, in, in East Asia, this was taken up actually as early as the 1970s. Um, you have people, for example, from South Korea uh, who had been irradiated by the bombing, uh, the U.S. bombing, I should note, uh, in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, um, coming to Japan to seek the same kind of medical benefits that Japan provided to Japanese citizens, right? So during uh, during the war and for the first, for first part of the 20th century, Japan colonized both Taiwan and Korea, and so at the time, Taiwanese and Koreans would have been Japanese subjects, right? Not citizens, because it's an empire. Um, but they would have been treated, you know, the same as, or at least uh, theoretically endowed with the same legal rights as uh, Japanese citizens and Japanese soldiers, um, and and Japanese victims, right? So uh, after 
Um, after Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Japan passed a law that would provide medical relief and other benefits to Japanese citizens, uh, even though there were uh, other people, Koreans, Taiwanese, and, other, and uh, POWs as well, um, working in Hiroshima and Nagasaki because they did not have citizenship. They were excluded from Japan's uh, medical and, and other pension systems, right? So the first litigation arises to seek compensation that Japan is already providing to its own citizens. Um, and uh, in the couple of lawsuits that take place in the 70s, uh, there is, uh, you know, Japanese courts actually play an important role in saying, yes, right, they may not be Japanese, um, but they are, you know, what they call universal hibakusha, hibakusha being the Japanese term for a victim of, uh, of the atomic bombing. Um, so that's kind of an, an interesting precursor, but it's not really until the 1990s. Um, and again, I'd, I'd uh, piggyback on what Professor Sadat just said about the 1990s as the uh, decade of international law, um, certainly the case at the international criminal level, but also I think the case at the uh, at civil litigation, right? That's sort of the rise of the alien tort statute claims in this country. Um, and in Japan and in Korea and in China, there's again a, a, um, a concerted effort made by um, lawyers, by scholars, by activists in those countries to turn attention to what Japan did um, in Korea, in China, and in other parts of Southeast Asia. So I'm sure many of you are familiar with the Comfort Women issue, which is still uh, still being litigated in Korea as we speak right now. It had been um, litigated numerous times, all to, uh, all to not, right, all to, to dismissals by Japanese courts. Um, forced labor, another issue that arose that continues to be litigated as we speak right now in South Korea, again, from World War II. Um, and, uh, and other claims um, involving casualties, uh, civilian casualties of people who were uh, victims of chemical uh, weapons attacks, um, human experimentation, uh, and other things that um, we talk about in, in Nuremberg, but we don't talk about, in my opinion, enough um, when it comes to Asia, and, and particularly Japan, which of course is a close ally of ours now, but was our enemy uh, during World War II. Um, so you see, you know, 100 or so cases in Japan, you see about 50 cases in Korea, you see a handful in other jurisdictions. Um, but this is the this is the setting and this is the research topic that I'm that I'm trying to address. Okay, so um, let me now shift to the theme of the conference, right, which is what can academics do. And of course, we've heard a lot about what academics can do. Um, and I'm using uh, the word academic in a somewhat narrow sense to mean, um, you know, people who have professional positions in the academy, right? I will say that in, in this particular movement I'm talking about in Japan and the rest of East Asia, lawyers, activists um, also play a key role, but here I'm, I'm shrinking it just to look at the, uh, you know, I actually found about a 10 people that I, I wrote about in the submission I made. Um, and let me just touch briefly on the kinds of roles they can play. Um, one of the most important things I think that researchers can do is uncover documents, right? That may sound super dry and super, you know, librarian and uh, utterly pedestrian. Um, but a lot of the things that we're talking about here with comfort women, for example, forced labor, for example, those, uh, the Japanese government and Japanese corporations had denied that there was any tie between, for example, the Japanese government and the comfort women station, comfort women system of basically enforced sexual slavery that Japan used in the 1930s and 1940s. Um, and it's not until uh, Japanese historians and others go to the archive, go to the National Defense Agency, go to their own university libraries and find these documents that say, oh no, actually the Japanese government um, authorized this particular comfort station to be set up, or uh, they found this document that actually linked Mitsubishi or Mitsui or one of these large, uh, large conglomerates uh, to the forced labor problem, right? So um, one thing that, that uh, academics have done, and there's a, a couple of famous examples I can talk about in the Q&A, is to find these documents that show who was involved, right? So again, the, the, the Japanese government's line up until 1991, 1992 was, yes, there were comfort stations, but they were purely private. They had nothing to do with the military, nothing to do with the government. That was just, uh, you know, pimps running brothels. Um, and then in 1992, uh, this Japanese academic finds uh, a number of documents that link the government, um, you know, uh, in indubitably to the uh, to the comfort women station uh, and system. And the government then uh, re rewrites its narrative, right? So now they say, well, yes, we were involved, uh, but there's no documentary proof to show that the women were coerced. It's a very legalistic argument. Uh, it's not a very believable argument, but there's, so they haven't cured the problem of denial, um, but now there are documents to show, well, that's a pretty uh, disingenuous explanation you're giving, right? So, so the first would be to uncover evidence or documents that link 
governments to, or, or uh, corporations as the case may be, to the underlying criminal activity. Um, the second uh, role I think uh, that academics can play is, and this is uh, I think so, you know, self-evident, is to actually come up with legal theories of liability, right? So in, in Japan, this has largely taken the form of tort law, right? If I beat you, if I rape you, if I slit your throat or uh, you know, use my bayonet to, to cut you open, that's obviously a tort. Now, again, calling it a tort maybe deprives it of some of its um, expressive significance to get to the point that uh, Professor Wolfendale was making yesterday about the importance of international criminal law and sending an expressive message. Um, tort doesn't have quite the same uh, je ne sais quoi of you know, crime against humanity or a, a use Kogan's violation, um, although clearly it was a use Kogan's violation. Nevertheless, it allows for some degree of legal liability. And then there's, there are dozens of court judgments, and I've written about them in Japan, where they say, yes, this was illegal, this was tortious, the, com the company is liable, the government is liable. Um, they will then exculpate those actors due to timeliness or due to treaty waiver or due to other, other factors such as that, but they do actually prescribe the underlying behavior and say, yes, this is actually uh, a violation of law. So, there, so I think another important um, factor here is that um, scholars are, thank you, are uh, charged with ensuring that um, information and legal theories, um, as well as uh, contemporaneous developments, right? So again, um, Japanese scholars are, are keenly aware of what's going on in Europe. They're keenly aware of what's going on in the United States. And so uh, during the, 1980, the late 1980s, there was a movement in the United States to compensate uh, Japanese Americans who had been interned by our government during World War II. Uh, and the Japanese will use that and say, well, look, the Americans are doing it. Um, uh, Germany has, has, I think, most famously uh, launched a number of initiatives to deal with the problem of, of forced labor and slave labor during World War II. Um, and though, and that's from, that's from 2000, 1999, 2000. Uh, and so uh, a, second, a second sort of theoretical um, lens or contribution that academics make is to keep uh, Japanese judges and the Japanese public aware of what's going on in other parts of the world. Um, the, the third element, of course, is um, providing expert testimony. So again, in the, in the full length paper, uh, as I said, I have 10 different uh, biographies and uh, eight of those people actually did testify in civil uh, litigation, trial level, appellate level. Um, so that's a very clear uh, link between the academy and uh, the, not, the, not the criminal prosecution, but the civil prosecution of some of these uh, um, atrocities. Um, and then the, the final thing, I think maybe uh, I'd be curious to hear what my fellow panelists um, think about this, uh, is the role of mobilization. Right, so um, I talk about this more in, in the paper at, at some length, but a number of these uh, Japanese uh, law professors and, and Chinese law professors are quite, um, quite self-consciously form a committee right, of four or five people who are also academics or like-minded fellows, um, and then they may decide uh, what they want to do, right? So they're gonna have a protest, they're gonna call their friends at the different newspapers and make sure that it's covered. Um, they're going to ask people to join the cause, raise funds, um, they're gonna uh, lobby members of the diet, and they're also going to um, liaise with lawyers in Japan who can bring these cases, right? So an important uh, aspect, and I, I think as, as certainly my own career, I'm not, not a mobilizing type, um, but I think it's an important contribution, an important uh, distinction that characterizes our, um, or you know, what, I would, what I would surmise, the American way of doing it with the, uh, with the Japanese way of doing it. The final thing I'll say, and, and again, I think this is interesting, and I'd be curious to hear if my fellow panelists have uh, thoughts about comparisons with the United States, is the um, creation of what are known in, in Japanese as trial support groups, okay? So, uh, you know, as I mentioned, there are 80 or so cases that have um, developed or um, unfolded in Japan. And for many of them, they're, uh, you know, Japanese citizens who, who are interested in this, who are, who are pacifists, who are members of the, of the Japanese left, um, want to get involved, right? And so there are um, civil society groups formed specifically to raise money, raise awareness, uh, arrange, arrange the logistics of Chinese plaintiffs or Korean plaintiffs flying to Japan, putting them up, taking them around. Um, so it's, I don't want to say it's a spectator sport, right? You're not going to get a t-shirt made or a, you know, a hat made with comfort, with lit comfort women litigation. Um, but there are uh, clear groups that are, um, and, and ways for average citizens, right? These are not necessarily academics, but you know, some of these groups have hundreds, thousands of members. Um, so that to me suggests some of the process of, of diffusion, right? That it's not just a court um, that no one reads about, there are actually people on the ground 
um, actively grappling with this and, and uh, hoping to get involved, right? So um, I will uh, end my comments there. I realize I should have taken my mask off. I'll put it back on again now that I'm going to shut up. Um, but I thank you for your attention and look forward to any questions you guys may have. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, um, Timothy, for that uh, presentation um, reminding us of the other tribunals, Im Im important work and yet a lot of crimes that were left off from the agenda, such as the use of comfort women and, and bringing up the issue of denial of crimes, which unfortunately in a lot of um, venues we, we also really confront problems with. So I'm going to turn next to Professor Beth von Skok. She is Leah Kaplan, Visiting Professor in Human Rights at Stanford Law School and a faculty affiliate with Stanford Center for Human Rights and International Justice. She previously served as Deputy to the Ambassador at Large for War Crimes Issues in the Office of Global Criminal Justice in the U.S. Department of State. So I invite Beth to discuss some of her recent research on the U.S. War War Crimes Act. Great. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. And it's really great to be invited, Michael, and everyone who helped make this happen. It's lovely to see everyone in person. Um, so taking off a little bit on Timothy's point about the various different roles that academics can play in the development and advancement and enforcement of international law, I thought I'd focus a little bit on the idea of legal reform. I've had a number of students in my human rights clinic and policy labs assisting with this effort. And so there's a role for students here as well. And then when I was at the Office of Global Criminal Justice, we commissioned the War Crimes Research Office at American University, which is a, um, has a number of students affiliated with it, to help um, with this process as well. And so there's really a great role for academic institutions to do the hard work of comparative law, of finding archives, looking through the travaux, which is the history of um, various legal efforts, et cetera. That's very difficult for judges to do, and policymakers certainly don't have time to do it either. And what I found working in government is showing the precedent, what positions were taken in the past can be incredibly useful in advancing those positions again in the future. So you're not sort of announcing some new position, but rather it's a position that, that the U.S. or whatever state is already on record as having, um, as having made. So I'm, I'm working on a paper now on proposed amendments to the War Crimes Act within the Title 18, which is essentially the U.S. federal um, penal code. War crimes, as we know, um, are very difficult to prosecute for a whole number of reasons. There's a lot of technicality associated with the constitutive elements. It's difficult to amass sufficient evidence, particularly battlefield evidence, although some of the new open source reporting is making that much easier these days. There's the vagaries of either unavailable or unreliable witnesses, in many cases do rely upon witness testimony still, notwithstanding that we have so much more digital evidence available to us. And then finally, there's the inevitable sort of khaki wall of silence, you know, finding individuals willing to testify who are most closest, who are the closest to the events in question can be quite difficult. Um, on top of these sort of universal concerns, the U.S. War Crimes Act has a number of structural barriers that make it very difficult to use. And in fact, it's been rendered a dead letter at this point, notwithstanding that it's been on the books for several decades. Um, no prosecution has ever been um, has been has ever been pursued under our our War Crimes Act, and so um, I've sort of been exploring why that is the case and making some recommendations as to how that can change. Um, a little bit by way of background, in case people are not familiar with the U.S. ratified the Geneva Conventions in 1955. As Layla mentioned, this was one of the outputs following World War II. There was a recognition of a further need to codify the prohibition against war crimes, and that was contained within the Geneva Conventions, which focused very much on international armed conflicts. There's just one small provision, Common Article 3, which addresses non-international armed conflicts. Um, at the time, it was determined that extant U.S. law sufficiently embodied U.S. Um, obligations under those treaties, and so no new legislation was drafted. They were looking to state law, federal law, and the newly minted Uniform Code of Military Justice. Over the years, however, it was realized that that was not, in fact, true, that the U.S. couldn't fully implement its obligations under those treaties, and so there was a move movement afoot to draft a war crimes act. Um in terms of substantive crimes, the first version of that act embodied the grave breaches provisions. And if you're familiar with those, those are the list of war crimes that are applicable in an international armed conflict. And it only applied for jurisdiction over U.S. persons, um, crimes committed either against or by U.S. persons. So we're talking the nationality principle of jurisdiction. If you read the Geneva Conventions carefully, it makes very clear that there's an obligation upon states to prosecute regardless of the nationality of the 
the parties involved. And so it was one of the few, first few treaties to articulate this idea of universal jurisdiction, which then gets copied in subsequent treaties moving forward, um, including, for example, the Torture Convention, the whole suite of terrorism conventions, et cetera. Um, there was... Um, the, the first draft was put in place. There was some concerns about both of those factors. One, that it only addressed international armed conflicts, and two, that the legislation did not fully advance um, universal jurisdiction as required by the treaty. So there were then some early amendments um, that both the Department of Justice, or, sorry, the Department of Defense and the Department of State quite strongly supported, which would add war crimes committed in non-international armed conflicts and then extend jurisdiction to any perpetrator, regardless of where the crime was committed or the nationality of the parties involved. Um, the first amendments did go forward, and so the legislation was expanded to include not only violations of Common Article 3, but violations of um, any protocol to the Geneva Conventions if and when the United States ratifies, which it has not yet done, but that's baked into the law if that were to happen. Violations of some other discrete law of war treaties, um, including the Hague Convention, which addresses means and methods of warfare, and that actually predated the Geneva Convention. So it was actually quite a strong and expansive um, statute when it came to substantive law. No change, however, was made to the universal jurisdiction element based primarily upon resistance from the Department of Justice, which which didn't want to have such an expansive jurisdictional reach, in part, I think, because they realized that these cases are quite hard to do and they didn't want the pressure of having to be searching for global evidence, global perpetrators, etc. The next major revision to our statute occurred actually as a, a feature of the global war on terror after the revelations of custodial abuse at Abu Ghraib and then the Supreme Court's ruling in Hamdan that the war against al-Qaeda constituted a non-international armed conflict. Through the Military Commission Act, Congress amended the War Crimes Act. Much attention was focused on the Military Commission Act on the creation of military commissions, which we know have been pretty much an unmitigated disaster when it comes to actually providing justice for acts of terrorism, including the attacks of 9-11, and I think Deborah and others will get into that this afternoon. Um, but it, the Military Commission Act also decriminalized certain elements of Common Article 3, including outrages upon personal dignity and violations of due process protections that individuals should have been given um, within a non-international armed conflict. And it very much had the custodial abuses and the um, military commission's sort of um, shortcuts around due process protections in mind by decriminalizing those acts. Finally, in 2008, a new statute criminalizing the use of child soldiers was drafted, which includes the full reach of universal jurisdiction. Jurisdiction can be exercised so long as the defendant is present in the United States. So it's not an unfocused universal jurisdiction, but if the defendant is within U.S. territory, then the case can go forward. So the structural deficiencies that I mentioned have been compounded by some interpretations by the Department of Justice that remain on the books. If you remember, there were a whole number of tree of um, memoranda that were drafted that were trying to reconceptualize the d definition of torture under international international and domestic law, um, due process protections, et cetera. Many of those treaties were withdrawn or repudiated both under the Bush administration and then later under the Obama administration. But there were two treaties that remain still technically sort of on the books, if we could call them that, that emerged from the Office of Legal Counsel. And they both attempt to reconceptualize what a protected person is and when individuals can be considered the victims of war crimes within an international armed conflict. And they, they argue essentially that only individuals who are acted upon either in a situation of occupation, a formal occupation of a country by a second country, or if the protected person is on U.S. territory. It's only then that they're considered a protected person and thus can be considered the victim of war crimes. Now, those memos are sort of on the books. I have no idea how influential they are, but it does stand as a sort of influential and maybe authoritative interpretation of U.S. treaty obligations and thus by by der derivation, an uh, interpretation of that, um, of our implementing legislation. So that's a barrier to being able to bring war crimes charges. Um, in addition, 
the statute makes a distinction that the law once made and that now it really no longer makes, except in some very narrow and limited circumstances, a distinction between conflict classification. International armed conflicts have always had more robust positive law associated with them, including in the war crimes context. Non-international armed conflicts have not had such strong positive law. The work of the tribunals has been essential to essentially collapse that distinction and make it possible to prosecute virtually the entire range of war crimes, regardless of conflict classification. Our statute, however, reflects that older version of law. And so the classification of the conflict is an element of the offense. And so the prosecution must prove that before they can bring a charge because they would have to charge under different heads of our war crime statute. That's an incredibly complex exercise, especially now when we're dealing with non-state actors, transnational terrorism groups, terrorist groups, that are operating within different overlapping conflicts and international intervention on behalf of various parties within these conflicts, both the sovereign actors, but also in support of the non-state actors. And so there may be um, complex uh, evidence involved in undergoing um, conflict classification, including evidence that is potentially classified. There may be interagency disputes as to how a conflict should be classified. Um, classifying the conflict may implicate various um, diplomatic relations with other states. And so to the extent that there is um, a, a lack of clarity or potential evidence cutting in different ways, that becomes um, information that must be shared with the defense because it's potentially exonerating if charges are being brought under either a non-international armed conflict or an international armed conflict framework. And so the solution, of course, would be to collapse those distinctions and redraft the statute with simply a list of war crimes that we know apply under customary international law regardless of conflict classification. Um, just two more deficiencies that I'll mention before closing. One is that, um, maybe surprising to many, the United States has no superior responsibility statute. So we can charge these crimes under for sort of direct perpetrators, under complicity theories, under conspiracy theories, but holding a commander liable who knew or should have known that their subordinates were committing abuses and who failed to intervene either to prevent them or then after the fact to properly punish them, that is not really available to um, our Department of Justice. Um, and so query whether we should have a sort of global superior responsibility statute that would apply to all of our atrocities crimes legislation, including the genocide statute, maybe a future crimes against humanity statute if one is ever drafted, our torture statute, and then potentially either even under our terrorism, um, trafficking and piracy statutes, which are also quite robust when it comes to the jurisdictional regime. Um, and then finally, I think we should reconsider um, recriminalizing the elements of crimes of, of common article three that were decriminalized with the Military Commission Act, particularly the outrages upon personal dignity have proven to be quite useful in the Syria conflict in European prosecutions, which are proceeding apace. They're way ahead of the United States when it comes to holding individuals liable for the crimes committed during the Syrian conflict. Any individual who posts on his, and it usually is his, but not always, social media stream, a picture of a severed head or a foot on the head of a detainee, that is an outrage upon personal dignity. And these are trophy photos that individuals have, have purposely had taken and then posted on their their social media profiles. Those pieces of evidence have been crucial in holding individuals liable. And because the Europeans have incorporated outrages upon personal dignity within their um, penal codes and the even deceased persons are entitled to be treated with respect, those charges have been able to be brought. Um, and so recriminalizing that within U.S. law, I think, would be helpful, particularly dealing with modern trends of um, abuses and the sources of evidence that are available. So all of these problems that I've identified can be addressed through discrete legislative changes, but potentially also even um, articulations by Congress of the sort of sense of Congress. And the OLC memos, I think, should be formally withdrawn so they're no longer governing or influential within decisions as to whether or not the war crime statute can be utilized. So I'll rest there and I look forward to our conversation. Great. Thank you so much, Beth, for that terrific history of the War Crimes Act. Um, great detail on exactly what gaps we have. And good luck. I hope 
we can get some of these fixed. Um, so I'm going to move to Professor Michael Newton. He is Professor of Practice of Law and Professor of the Practice of Political Science at Vanderbilt Law School. He's also Director of the Vanderbilt in Venice program. He will address the interface of domestic and international law and some new emerging issues. Well, thanks for that. Um, so at the risk of sounding like a geeky law professor, one of the things that I did during COVID was to kind of take time. You always say, I wish I had time to do the following. Uh, one of the things I did was take time to go back and read some of the original sources of a bunch of things that I had read many years before and it had shaped. And I just have to say, it's so nice to be back with people because we don't have time to read as much. And it's so nice to see friends where we can cross fertilize in person rather than just reading each other's writings or talking on the phone or talking on Zoom. So one of the thematic things that I think has shaped cer certainly my career and a lot of my friends and everybody on this stage in one way or another, which is what drives academics, comes from Marcus Aurelius. Um, it's a quote incorrectly often attributed to President Reagan. But here's Marcus Aurelius uh, in book seven. He says, when you have done good and another has benefited, you're doing good and it is a positive influence in the world, um, why do you still look like fools for a third thing besides credit for that good work or a return? And I think that's the common theme of what academics have done in, in the piece I'll write uh, for this, both in the, in, in, in the IMT and the IMTFE, academics had a really critical role in the foundation and the formation and the negotiations and that process of bringing together what becomes, going back to Omri, state practice. Right? We point to the treaty. But it's a lot of the academic influence very quietly that brings about that articulation of crimes against humanity, that brings about, as Beth pointed out, in the Rome Statute context, the merger of, of international and non-international armed conflicts. It's academics that are, to say it in the Newton way, it's the, the academics are the grout that kind of hold the system together, that, that in some ways energize the system and drive states. And so that's the three blocks I want to talk about. Um, in the first place, uh, the academics have had profound influences in getting at the domestic level and taking both the development of international norms, but then implementing them. I'm looking at Dean Michael Scharf. So we're on the ground in Uganda. And the question is, how do we have a domestic war crimes process that actualizes Geneva Convention obligations and creates crimes against humanity obligations? So academics are, are good at several things. As you well, not all equally good, but everybody on this stage is really good at this. Um, they can debate. They can take countering positions. They can create consensus. Uh, and there's a deep breadth of expertise that is well-read and reasoned, right? These are experts. And they don't go around talking about their expertise as much, but when you throw something at them, they typically have stuff to draw on. Those are very useful skills in diplomatic negotiations. The other thing that academics are very good at doing, um, which we've done in domestic contexts all around the world, is we're good writers and thinkers. We can take what you've said, so Dean Scharf and I would debate all day long. We would stay up quite late. We would capture what had been done in great legal text, and we would walk back in the next morning about 8 a.m. and say, okay, here's a consolidated legal text. Academics can do that, and a lot of people can't. Uh, in the negotiations of the ICC Elements of Crimes, we did exactly the same kind of thing. You would capture developments, and academics have a real profound influence in that way. The other thing, of course, is, and for me, this springs from a very deep uh, commitment to the rule of law. We all have day jobs. Right? So when, when Beth goes to G, GCJ, she always has the, the, the landing pad of her real job. Right? She's going to go back. When I go to the former the Office of War Crimes Issues, I'm going to go back to my real job. Right? So we're not there just for career advancement. We're not there. We're there to serve. And we're there because we're deeply committed to the law. And, you know, I would say the same about Layla and the Crimes Against Humanity Convention. There's lots of examples here. And I think that's very important because what it does is it creates the energy and the depth and the commitment to do what's necessary, but not really for personal aggrandizement, for the integrity of the law. And that, I think, really works well. Um, 
The other thing that, that we've done a lot of at the domestic level is direct support to judges. You know, I'm looking at my wonderful friend, Jimmy. Jimmy reminded me earlier, we've known each other for 30 years, right? So as soon as we stand up, it's academics that negotiate the special court for Sierra Leone. And as soon as we stand up the special court, we get the prosecutor put in, we get the registrar put in, we set up this wonderful little creature called the Academic Consortium driven by academics. And the point is that judges and prosecutors and the registry can ask pointed questions on a non-attribution basis. And you see those academics help fill that gap um, to say, you know, Case Western contributed to the academic consortium and, you know, a bunch of schools. We work together to, to really give concrete, and I could point if we had time, to dozens of judicial opinions or dozens of prosecutor policies or dozens of examples in oral argument where people draw from that depth of technical expertise. The direct support is invaluable. And, and what I tell my students is, you know you did it. Whether you get credit for it or not is not the point because you're helping to create the integrity of the law. So it's a very profound but often subtle influence. The second big category to me is really the pragmatics. Um, again, because the academics are drawing from a depth of expertise. They have read, right, the oral arguments in the Yamashita case, right? You've read the, the historical documents and you've, you've thought about it in a way that's not driven uh, by the press of current events. Beth alluded to this, as did Layla, right? When you're in a policymaking position or you're on a prosecutorial team, you're busy. And so the idea that you have a backstop, a luxury that you can use the academic consortium or you can use, you know, uh, the War Crimes Office at American or whatever to help fill the gap is invaluable to you. But then what happens is you get a real depth of technical expertise that's also based on the pr pragmatic application in the real world. So it's practical. It's real. It's pragmatic. And I could give you a bunch of examples of this. I'm looking at my friend Jeff Korn. Um, we were asked to do oral, uh, Amici arguments in the Antigonda case about a very detailed, very complex real world situation. And of course, you can see, well, there's the term in the treaty. But at this point, it's an interpretive question. And it's the pragmatic expertise based on both the real correct articulation of state practice, but that state practice done against a very deep understanding of the law. And, and it's the academics who make those Amici arguments, right? When we did oral arguments in the Bashir case, in the Jordan case, uh, you know, it's Claus Kress sitting next to me. Academics provide that depth. Uh, and we based our arguments on the Mapping Bashir project. It's the best data set in the world on where Bashir went and why and how and what was state response and what was state practice, what is the correct articulation of customary international law and opinio juris vis-a-vis the travels of Omar Bashir as a sitting head of state and uh, subject to warrant of arrest from the ICC. Trial teams simply don't have the time and the bandwidth and the luxury to do that, and neither do diplomats. So academics provide an invaluable pragmatic backdrop to really clearly articulate state practice. The other example uh, is, is a lot more detailed, and I'll do this in writing. I don't have time to do it completely here. Uh, but in the actual context of treaty negotiations, this is what Layla has found in negotiating the Crimes Against Humanity Convention. This was absolutely true in the London Charter, where the academics bring a depth of expertise to correctly capture the law. Okay, So just a couple of examples from our work in the Rome Statute. Uh, the Rome Statute picks up in the, in the war crime of appropriating enemy property, it picks up the 1899 and 1907 Hague language, right? You can only do that unless it's imperatively demanded by the necessities of war. So the question then is, what is really state practice? What is that actually saying as a matter of binding law, binding customary international law? And it takes academics and legal technical experts in the elements of crimes to say that's really just an articulation of military necessity. It, there's no such animal as, in, it, you know, expedient military necessity. We rejected that based on some academic writings at, at the Nuremberg Tribunal, right? Military necessity is a constrained concept. It's not just Krieg's raison, do anything you want. We know that. 
But beneath that threshold, it's the academics who help fill that gap. So then the ICC elements, it simply says military necessity. That's what it means. Another example, of course, is pillage. This came up in Bemba. It came up in Antigonda. It's a common... When is the appropriate line between pillage, taking for personal reasons, and an, and an appropriate taking of property based on a valid articulation of military necessity? There's a lot of law there. And it takes academics to be able to compile that and, and, and persuade it in a, in, a, in a way that accurately reflects real state practice. Really critically important. And then the last example, I was talking to Ahmad about this earlier, um, is, you know, in Article 28, you know, the command responsibility language in the Rome Statute, what we say is, of course, we pick up the new or should have known standard from the Far East Tribunal. Um, no problem there. And we've got the depth of analysis to say why that's totally legally correct. But it then takes academics to say, okay, what does, the, what are the necessary and reasonable steps the, that a commander takes with that knowledge? Again, the trial teams are too busy. And I also say, I mean, I'm a prosecutor and actually a defense counsel on occasion, so I can say this. On a trial team, I'm busy shaping the law and shaping the facts to serve the needs of my client. It, it is an incredibly valuable function, though, for somebody who's a little more attenuated, a little more remote to be able to come in and say, great, shape the facts. Shape. But here's the binding under the bedrock of law based on state practice. That's incredibly valuable because as a litigator, I'm busy litigating and shaping the facts to suit my particular purposes on behalf of my particular client. So this was the big issue in Bemba that Hamad is researching, right? And then the last one, and I could give lots of examples, but since I'm on the topic, I'll just give the Bemba example, is that I, it, Academics so often provide the, the depth of, of practice back to the real world. So there's a, there's a practice-based approach here. Um, Tim alluded to this. It's the academics who can go back in and say, this is what was actually written in you know, the Tate letter and the background behind the Tate letter, the actual documentation, practice, state practice, state practice. So one of the issues in Bemba is, is it necessary and reasonable for a military commander or a civilian person who's effectively acting as a military commander in a non-state armed conflict, wh what does international law actually require as necessary and reasonable measures? You go through that analysis, and the trial chamber said that you're required to withdraw and end a military operation upon the first indicators of allegations of war crimes or crimes against humanity, which effectively would end military operations. It would effectively end operational command. It would effectively end UN peacekeeping operations. And it's the academics who were able to go back and say, here's what necessary and proper means. And by extension, here's what necessary and proper does not mean. Because it's based on state practice. And there's zero evidence in state practice that there's a duty, a binding duty on all military commanders in the face of allegations of war crimes to simply withdraw their forces. Um, there's just no evidence of state practice. And that's what the academics do, and so, so much more. So what I'd say is um, frame your questions, because we all have a lot to talk about and a lot of experience. Thank you. Thank you for those remarks, Mike. And finally, last but certainly not least, is Jim Johnson. He's director of the War Crimes Research Office here at Case Western Reserve School of Law. He also teaches international criminal law. Jim is also the chief prosecutor of the residual special court for Sierra Leone. He previously served for a decade as the chief of prosecutions of the special court for Sierra Leone, where he supervised the prosecution of several high profile cases, including that of former Liberian president, Charles Taylor. So Jim, I know that Case Western students have been doing extensive work um, related to the field of international justice. Do you want to tell us about some of this work? Uh, sure. Thank you, Jen. And, and you know, perhaps what I'm going to do is, is to carry the discussion that that Michael started and, and looking at some of the practical effects 
of the academy and prosecuting war crimes for crying out loud. And, and you know, Michael addressed some academic perspective. And, and don't be fooled when he says the academic perspective, because all of those academics that are sitting along here and, and are making tremendous contributions have a whole cadre of students behind them. So, 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 so don't be fooled by what they're saying. But, but anyway, I, I'm going to look at it more from the, from the actual direct participation of students and what they've been doing in the prosecution of war crimes. You, and, and, and you know, I think I kind of have, I, I, I may bring a unique perspective to this because I've seen it from both sides. I spent 10 years in Sierra Leone prosecuting these cases. And for crying out loud, if we hadn't had the students there, we wouldn't have gotten our job done. There is absolutely no doubt about that. In Sierra Leone in particular, but across the board on these international tribunals, you, you hear about the ICC having difficulty because they don't have the staff, they don't have the resources. This translates to all of the international tribunals. We're starved for resources. We need more help. And quite frankly, a supply of students is uh, in many ways what kept us going in Sierra Leone? Michael Scharf will tell you about, you know, Cox centers and their ability to fund interns and send them to these tribunals. And I think it's up over 150 interns from, from case alone that have gone directly to the tribunals. And this doesn't mention, you know, all of the other unit schools that are represented up here. And for that matter, all of the schools that are represented around the world. I ran a prosecution section in Sierra Leone that, you know, in our best of times, I had 24 attorneys under me trying four cases. And when you look at the, the complexity of these cases, that's just simply not enough. There were times where I had nearly as many interns in my office. And, you know, an intern walked into the office. We did a quick assessment, and, and because we had great relationships with schools, and we were able to say, identify our needs for interns, and they would only send us the very, very best. These interns walked into our office, and my gosh, you know, they were, they were a junior attorney from the minute they walked in the office. And we had them doing that kind of work. We had them preparing submissions. I had them prepping, preparing witnesses for testimony, reviewing material from our investigators and, and, and bringing out of that material the critical information that we needed. And so quite frankly, we would not have survived without having those interns at the office. We could not have, a con I, I, I'm very comfortable in saying, well, I won't say we couldn't have accomplished our job, but gosh, it would have been a whole lot harder. And when we were already putting in 12 to 14 hour days, and for current, and these interns were walking in, and you know, they were in the office at seven in the, e seven in the morning and leaving the office at nine or 10 in the evening. And so, so that shows you how much we depended on them and how much we focused on them. And, and it went beyond that uh, through the War Crimes Research Office at Case Western, through, um, through numerous schools and the assistance. We had students that were the ability to take very, very specific, Michael discussed this a little bit, take very, very specific questions and issues that we could foresee coming down the line. And we needed some information. We needed some research. And, uh, and that, you know, for that coming into us, oh gosh, I'd get these boxes from Case Western. Now keep in mind that uh, these boxes had traveled from, um, from Cleveland to, uh, to Sierra Leone, quite often these boxes, you know, and a, a heavy box full of volumes of research, you can imagine just how heavy that is. And, you know, I'm sorry, but I don't know that you did a great job packing those boxes at this end, I want to tell you that. But, but usually by the time we got them, those boxes were completely wrapped in tape and almost destroyed, but the bottom line is the research survived. And, and so uh, that is what made the difference for us. It, it was a great value. And, you know, and, and I say that, I mean, not only 
did I get the benefit of it? Now I'm kind of on the supplier side, but I'm also still on the benefit side of it because I've got I've got one of Mike's interns working for me right now in the office of the residual prosecutor. I've got a case intern working for me this fall as a capstone, and I've got um, two other interns that work through the summer, and quite frankly, I'm keeping them working a little bit into the fall. And so... Uh, so the, these are these are where students are making practical and real differences in their own right. They're not at the university where they're where they have a professor supervising them any minute. They're out on their own, and you're sending them out there into the real world. And so you know that's that's kind of what I think of when I think of you know so much in the way that. The academy contributes, contributes and has contributed now for over 20 years to these war crime prosecution. That's kind of the first thing that comes to mind. Well, then we kind of carried that a little farther. And uh, when Dave Crane came back from Sierra Leone and when I came back from Sierra Leone, we kind of said, well, what else can we do with students? And uh, what other contributions can they make? I don't know. You've got your Case Global uh, magazine in front of you. Turn to the first story in the magazine, and it talks about the student-led initiative documents atrocities in Yemen. Now, this started off with Dave Crane's creation of the Syrian Accountability Project, ten, gosh, believe it or not, it's 10 years old now, uh, looking at, at Syria and having students document the crimes in the student. And, and based on our lessons coming out of our prosecutions in Sierra Leone, these students are creating a conflict narrative they're creating crime-based matrix, um, doing a deep dive into most egregious incidents, identifying and studying most responsible parties, preparing multiple white papers case, uh, our Yemen project, which we started three years ago. We brought the SAP model to case, and I started the Yemen project three years ago, and we have put out two white papers. Oh, put that sign down for crying out loud. And we, 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 we brought out uh, two white papers on corporate aiding and abetting responsibility in Yemen, and on starvation, the crime of using starvation as a war crime in Yemen. SAP has completed multiple, multiple white papers. And, and of course, we're looking down the line to creating sample indictments. Why are we doing this? Because hopefully we will see someday that there will be accountability coming out of that. The Syrian project has thus far created over 30,000 pages of documentation. And where was the first place it went? It went to the IIIM when it was established a few years ago. And so we're very, now, we kind of thought, well, we can do more with this. And so we created a not-for-profit called the Global Accountability Network. And how can we create these similar student-led initiatives at other universities? Through the Global Accountability Network, we've created a Venezuela accountability project. When I mentioned case for Yemen, I, Melina, you're here somewhere. We've had great students from Cleveland Marshall in case. The Syria project not only includes Syracuse University, but the University of Michigan. But we've also created a similar project for Venezuela that has uh, the University of Toronto and Florida International University. And that project has received support from the Organization of American States with blessing all the way up to the Secretary General of the OAS. Now we're also in negotiations in, in early talks with a school in Australia to set up another project outside the country. And so, but the point of all of this is not the point of, is not what we're doing, but the point of all of this is that these are students able to get actively involved in looking at atrocity crimes going on right now and preparing the foundation for what we hope will be eventual accountability. Okay, um, I think I'm done, but thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jim. And it's just amazing the work you're able to do. And for any of the students in the room who've been working on it, congratulations. It's terrific. Um, it, it sometimes uh, a long and what's the, what's the title of your book? Long and winding. The water always finds its way. There will eventually be justice. That's the point, right? Um, so um, I do want to do a, a round of student questions. Um, 
I think I'll do a lightning round first to our panelists, um, but students start thinking of your questions and just so that they're picked up, um, I will ask the students and if you wanna, I see one mic, maybe start forming a line. Is there a second mic over on the other side? You can form a line over there as well. Start coming forward. I'm gonna still do a lightning round so you can just start thinking and thinking about coming forward. So I'll go very quickly back to our panelists for maybe two, two minute responses. So um, Layla, I was gonna ask you the likelihood of the passage of the Crimes Against Humanity Convention and or your work as special advisor, but if you all, or if you wanna talk about what academics don't do well, <laughs> um, which kind of intrigued me, you mentioned that to me, um, feel free in two minutes to do any of those. Um, I, I, I will answer your original question. So. Uh, the reason I was thinking that I might talk a little bit about what academics don't do well is I don't want to get into some sort of self-aggrandizement about um, uh, that, that we're the origin and be all and end all. I think Omri raised a great point, which is, A, we have... Um, we, we have obligations to the international community as well as to our students, our university, and our deans who, who uh, pay our salaries. Uh, and, and see, there's a lot of things that academics actually don't do well. And, and one of the things we haven't talked about is there's a big part of the academy that engages in nothing but critique. So on this particular panel, you have a lot of people who are doing active projects, but uh, if we had collected a different group of academics, you would have had a very different set of responses because our, our, our job really is to take things and criticize them as well as to, to build up. And so that I just wanted to bring that into the conversation. In terms of the special advisor project, echoing just what um, Professor Johnson had said, we have had teams of students at WashU um, um, working on very confidential issues uh, on very, very important questions that have gone to the ICC um, prosecutor directly that have informed and shaped many of the uh, prosecutors, the second prosecutors projects. Um, it was a little difficult. Maybe we could later this afternoon talk about the fact that the prosecutor was sanctioned by the United States government for a year, which meant that we had to suspend our uh, in-house project because we couldn't really be working for somebody who was under uh, U.S. sanctions. Um, but fortunately, the sanctions are gone. And so that does provide sort of a similar opportunity. We also were part of the, the academic consortium for the special court for Sierra Leone. I, d I do think we couldn't do anything uh, uh, without our students. And I actually really echo the important role of students in um, helping us think through our problems. Most of us teach at universities where we don't have 10 colleagues doing the same thing we're doing. And so the students provide not only uh, research and, and get experiential learning themselves, but also help us shape our own ideas. And I've certainly had that experience during during my career. I have more I could say, but I won't because I see lots of questions too. Great, um, thanks. Um, Tim, um, what do reparations efforts look like in contemporary East Asia? And what is the likelihood recent Korean verdicts will produce lasting reconciliation? Thank you. Um, how is this working now? You can kind of hear me? Okay. Um, so uh, there's a, a number of forms that they can take. Um, I think some of the best examples actually come, and I, I mentioned this very briefly, um, from Germany. Um, Germany, under strong pressure from the United States, did put together a, um, a remembrance fund that would pay uh, forced laborers for their work, um, and both the German government and German corporations contributed to that fund. They contributed about $5 billion U.S., 5B. Um, to that fund and paid, you know, nominal, but I think symbolically significant amounts to uh, the million or so people who were um, uh, forced to serve as, as slave laborers during World War II. Um, within, uh, within East Asia, there have been uh, domestic laws passed um, by the Japanese actually early on in the 1980s and more recently by the Koreans to handle some aspect of it. But what the, what the problem is, uh, is that, you know, Japan has its view and Japan thinks that this has all been settled by the 1965 claims agreement between Japan and Korea. And the Koreans have a different view, which is to say, everything you did from colonialism forward was illegal. So even if you have a legal basis for it, that legal basis was itself illegal. Um, so somebody, somebody in the United States perhaps, um, I think needs to, and the US has, I think, uh, tried to, um, 
uh, navigate this dispute with with two of its close and essential allies in East Asia. Um, but it's it's very hard, and um, these judgments that are coming out are really ratcheting up tensions. Um, I, I would hope that a, a Biden administration like the Obama administration realize that this is not just a historical dispute. Um, Japan, Korea tensions are at their lowest in 50 years because of these judgments. You know, they've stopped sharing military intelligence. They've they've started putting on uh, you know boycotts and things like that. Um, and in a region where you have North Korea and an increasingly assertive China, um, it's not merely a historical dispute. It's actually the the, the withering away of diplomatic ties. So um, someone needs to. Uh, cajole people in in in, uh, in smoky back rooms to get this thing resolved. And uh, as I said, maybe the Obama administration will will take that up. Um, the Obama administration tried, but I'm not sure it was as engaged as it as it might have been. Great. Sorry. <laughs> Great. Thank you for that. I don't know. What, OK, I'll be back here now. Um, Okay, Beth, I'll ask. I, I won't use the mic. I'll, yeah. Um, Beth, uh, you have laid out the gaps in the US War Crimes Act. I don't know in your writing, have you done any kind of draft of a proposal of a new War Crimes Act? Are you thinking about doing this? And do you think there would be interest in Congress in getting this kind of work passed? I have not yet. Thank you for that. Um, that's step two, I think. Um, it's a relatively easy and discreet fix, though, so I think it could be done relatively um, easily. There is a little bit of energy and interest around actually a crimes against humanity statute, and there's a sense that you can only kind of get one of these, maybe even a cycle, <laughs> sadly. Um, and so there's sort of two efforts afoot. One would be to um, expand the Torture Victim Protection Act to include additional causes of action. If you know that statute well, you know it's only allows for civil jurisdiction. It's not a criminal statute, but civil jurisdiction over acts of torture or extrajudicial killing. And so the idea would just be to expand that to make clear that other causes of action are available under that statute, in part to res reflect the fact that the, su the Supreme Court has significantly shrunk in the utility of the alien tort statute in this realm. So that's one set of proposals that are moving forward. And then there's this Crimes Against Humanity statute that actually traces back to the late 2000s. Um, Senator Durbin's office took the lead on the genocide statute, the child soldier statute, and this was going to be his trifecta. Some resistance emerged both within the um, interagency process and then there were some NGOs that didn't like the direction in which the definition had gone, including sort of adding an and between widespread and systematic. If you know that um, formulation, you know it's always been an or. And so there was some resistance at the time and it, the, the project sort of died on the vine. When President Obama initiated his Atrocities Prevention Initiative, there was work done to revive that project, um, recognizing that that was a big gap in the penal code. Um, again, it didn't come to fruition, and so now there's some e effort amongst civil society groups to try and restart that. So I have a feeling that is a higher priority, um, and, and to the extent that Congress takes up something in this space, given all of the other priorities um, that they're faced with in terms of the domestic agenda, I think probably probably one of those two would be more likely to, to pop rather than um, amendments to the war crime statute. But, you know, let's see. Great. Thank you. And Mike, just a quick question. You, you brought up a, the Bamba case. And just in my reading of the case, and I mean, for anyone in the audience who doesn't know, this was, you know, a mass atrocity crime case dealing with um, C uh, DRC forces going into CAR involving mass murder, rape, um, and pillage um, resulted in a complete acquittal, not one of the most glorious moments for the ICC. But when you look at the appeals chamber, what the appellate chamber judges did, in my mind, and I'm just curious of your take on this, is that they switched the, cham the standard of review. They got it wrong. And uh, the majority, um, not the dissent. But um, Prior appellate chambers had been really looking, and I'm going back to ICDY and ICDR, but I think also ICC to some extent, could a reasonable trier of fact at the trial chamber have reached that conclusion? Well, if a reasonable person could have, we're not going to put our... We're, we're not going to put our thinking in their place. We didn't hear all the evidence. We weren't there. They judged all the evidence. And what it looked like they did in the Bemba case was 
cherry pick and say, you know, are we persuaded by isolated pieces of evidence? Well, we're not, so we're going to overturn it. They did not seem to be, in my mind, following the correct standard. I'm, I'm just curious of your thoughts no, on that's that. A, that's a good question. Is this on? Yeah. I'm glad I'm not getting like my eardrums blown out. Um, so I had an Iraqi judge one time, and I'll, I'll answer the BIMA question directly, but I think this is a useful backdrop. Uh, Iraqi judge one time, we were working on an appellate decision, and he said to me, he said, uh, do you think, professor, you know, it's very sort of honorific, he said, do you think people will read our decisions the way they read the Nuremberg IMT decision? And my question, my answer was, maybe too flippant. Well, you've got to write that kind of decision first, right? I actually think that that criticism of Bimba, which is pretty widely made on blogs, et cetera, misses the point because it's exactly backwards. You've got to get the facts. Remember that one of the other critical things in Bimba was that there's this huge campaign of atrocities, and the OTP picked out two little incidences and essentially put them under a microscope without, and the, and the trial chamber overlooks that, and then there's some really complicated factual issues with what the trial chamber actually did with even those two incidences. And so what the appeals chamber did was kind of take a macro look against the backdrop of what they understood to be the correct articulation of customary international law. And one of the other criticisms of Bema, which I know Layla has made, uh, and, and there's some foundation for this, is to say that they just did too much in restricting the, the, the ability of the prosecutor to select you know, there's this line from Christine Van Vanguard, you know, two, two incidences in the midst of this long camp doesn't make widespread or systematic. So there's a lot more criticisms than what you're saying. It's not just the evidentiary standard of review. It's that they were convinced, or at least a majority was convinced, that what had been done was unsustainable based on a good faith interpretation of Article 28. And that's just, it's way more complicated than that on the facts. But that's the gist of it, was that is this a, a, a good faith effort to implement Article 28 based on customary international law? Majority said no. I mean, and it's, you know, you can, I think what it does though too is it really sets up, particularly on the causation element, a lot of ground for further development, particularly on causation. So I think Layla's gonna do like a 30 second and then we really are getting to students. Um, so I'm not gonna debate my dear friend and colleague, uh, Professor Newton on Bemba, other than to say I, you can read my writings on the 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 decision, which I think was was a travesty. Um, but <laughs> um, what I would say is looking forward, which was really your question, uh, the Nitaganda appeal doesn't cite Bemba. It doesn't even cite the Bemba appeal. And so I think we can turn the page on that particular part of the standard for review. I think we're going to see, which is really the key question, is the trial judges sitting now are saying, oh, my God, are they going to overturn us anytime they feel like it? And I think the answer is no. We're going to go back to the old standard. And I think you're reading the tea leaves. You can see that they don't explicitly criticize the Bemba judgment and the new standard, but they actually just don't. They're, they're ignoring it. And so I think Bemba on the issue of appellate review, we'll just, we're going to just turn the page and go back to business as usual. Yeah, can I two-finger that too? I'm not debating. I think Layla's exactly right. But what it does is it says to ICC trial judges, create a record, like do a really good job at trial like you should have done in the Bimba case. Because when you look at the facts, it's really, there's a lot to attack. And, and I think that's what the, that's, you know, on appellate review, and I think the message to ICC trial chambers now is, right, do a better job at the trial level. Well, we could have a, a Newton Sadat back and forth, but we're, I'm going to break it off. So, um, Hello. Um, my name is Hamad. Uh, I'm a doctoral uh, student at Emory. Um, I'm actually working at Superior Responsibility uh, on my thesis. I just have uh, three brief questions, uh, if you allow me, please. Uh, the first question is directed to Professor Sada um, with regard to her attempts of codifying crimes against humanity. 
Uh, do you think that the, con the contextual elements of crimes against humanity listed in the Rome Statute would help you, you know, some sort of help you uh, um, adopt some of these elements? And um, the second question is directed to uh, Professor Beth. Um, so you just said that uh, superior responsibility is not really, um, there's no United uh, States law that regulates superior responsibility. What do you think about the labor code that even though it has a, a lato senso mm -hmm. norm of superior responsibility, but do you think it would help you to create such statute? And the third question is directed to Professor Michael Newton. Um, so one of the, irrespective of the substance of uh, the elements of superior responsibility, the appeals chamber, they disregarded the hearsay evidence. Um, and it's, it's, as you know, the Rome Statute doesn't have a, uh, an explicit uh, uh, article discussing the hearsay. Uh, but as we know that her say from the jurisprudence of the UN tribunals, it could be admissible if it's appropriate and relevant. However, if you if it's not if it's not um, the judges are not required to you know uh, investigate their truthful or not, but they have to investigate their relativity to the to the case. So could you discuss this issue? Great. Um, Thank you. That was actually three in one. So um, but why don't we have the other questions posed yeah. really quickly? Sure, thank you. My name is Natalie Eberts. I'm a law student here. And my question actually was already asked by Professor Trahan about the political will to Professor Von Schock. So I guess my add-on to that would be, um, what would be the best advocacy pathway or strategy for some of the more likely legislative reforms that you mentioned? Are there any lessons learned from similar um, success or near success on legislative reforms? And also to Professor Newton, are there any efforts to create a compensation scheme for maybe similar to the German one that you mentioned for victims of war crimes in the US? I think there were some congressional efforts to use frozen um, assets from state sponsors of terrorists to give relief to terrorist victims. I'm wondering if there's anything afoot um, or political will for creating any of those. Thanks. Thank you all for being here. Um, my question's a little broader, so whichever ones of you would like to um, answer it, please feel free. Um, I was just kind of wondering, over the course of your careers, considering you spent a lot of time mm -hmm. in the field of international law, um, whether your understanding of the implications of the Nuremberg trials has shifted over time and how you see that um, affect current war crimes prosecutions. Thank you. That's a great question. Hi, my name is uh, Matt Fennell. I'm also a law student here. Um, I had the privilege of being over um, in Germany this past summer for a while. And um, there was lots of talk, obviously, about Nuremberg. And I saw a couple historical sites. Uh, in particular, um, one of the concentration camps I went, um, there was a memorial there. And um, there were just two words on it. It just said, never again. And um, both watching kind of the documentaries they, sh they showed there and listening to, to kind of the things they said, it seemed almost more um, than getting their own justice and holding people accountable. They wanted to make sure that what they endured and their families endured never happened again. So what mechanisms do you feel are in place, not only to hold people accountable, but to discourage that type of like crimes against humanity from coming up before, before it even happens in, in that sense? So with the audience's indulgence, we'll take like, you know, five more minutes over and I'll just have each panelist uh, address whatever they would like of all these great questions. And we'll go in the same order. So Layla, one minute to pick on any of this. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I think I'll actually take the last question uh, about, or the next to the last question about how have my ideas about Nuremberg changed. A lot of it has been, um, when we used to think about Nuremberg as sort of this iconic moment, it was 
a bit of a dead letter. And we only thought about it in terms of the West. And we only thought about it in terms of men. And we didn't really think about um, ideas about global justice in terms of the whole globe. So I loved, actually, Professor Webster's contribution, because we really, really started to think about Asia and what um, the Tokyo trials meant and what the legacies are there. We've started to bring women and minorities and people of color in. We've realized by digging through documents and thinking in a critical way, as academics are supposed to, that this iconic moment also had flaws. Um, so to me, that that is one of the big questions. And, and that's how we grow and we evolve and we change and, and hopefully make um, international justice truly international and more inclusive and more diverse. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Um Tim, do you want to um, address any of those in one uh, minute? Uh, Layla just uh, very shrewdly, uh, 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 mm -hmm. I think, said what, what I was about to say. I, oh. I have a, a much different view of Nuremberg, I think, than I did when I was in law school, for reasons that I think Layla has already quite eloquently laid out. So I will uh, hand my time back to the three remaining panelists. Okay. Then, then we're up to Beth. Not at all. <laughs> Yeah, a great question about the Lieber Code. Um, and actually, it's quite interesting that superior responsibility finds expression in multiple places in U.S. law, except Title 18. Yeah. So there have been alien tort statute cases. There are immigration cases where individuals are being prosecuted for immigration fraud or are deported on the basis of superior responsibility. We have military law. We've, re we've recognized it in customary international law. The Yamashita case, case that was mentioned um, turned on an articulation of superior responsibility. So while Lieber is there, it only governed the Civil War and the, the so-called federal forces at that time. Where we do find a very good articulation of it is in the Military Commission Act, ironically enough. Mm -hmm. There's a very strong formulation that's quite accurate <laughs> under international law. And so that provision could be used as a model to just create a broad-based command responsibility provision that would apply across the international crimes within the penal code. So that would be my recommendation of where to look for language. Great. Thanks. Mike? Yeah, it's funny. I'm going to take the Nuremberg question because I think that's a nice way to kind of wrap up as well. And I want to add to what Layla said. Um, you know, I think we do typically, I'm not speaking for Case Western, but in my experience, we do a terrible job of really teaching the nuance of Nuremberg in law school. Like we get the big picture stuff. And then over time, you really learn the nuance and the details and the evidentiary issues and all of that. And I was left with the impression in law school that, you know, we set up the Isle of War Crimes Commission. This was a, a big diplomatic effort where states worked together because they recognized the importance of collecting evidence in real time. And then it was a logical kind of a sequential thing. I think the shift now is you realize, no, it was driven by particular people and particular personalities that had the tenacity, really, to collect evidence. And for me, that's the lesson. Uh, in modern times, right, so we, we mentioned, for example, prosecutions in Germany. Well, that's based on siege evidence. That's based on private actors and law professors who got on the ground in Syria, and I was part of that, Unbelievable. So like day one, and the same in Iraq. So this idea that, that it's the states that have the center of gravity, the states, I think it's now understood correctly to be a really integrated effort. There's a whole private dimension, and states have a critical role, but they're so sluggish oftentimes, and you got the bureaucracy and the politics, it has to work together. And if we, if we drop one or both of those balls, I think we look back at Nuremberg and we're like, yeah, we can't do that anymore. I think we have to, in the modern era, have a comprehensive, consolidated effort. Yeah. Jim, I, I don't know if this yeah, will and, work for you. And maybe I'll just comment on the, the, last, the last question there about your visit to Germany and never again. And, um, you know, it is interesting. I mean, of course, the German people didn't immediately take to Nuremberg and what was happening, and it took a number of years, but certainly over the years they have. And you look at what's coming out of Germany now. I mean, Germany is is one of the d domestic states taking the lead in domestic war crimes prosecution and going after those that they find in Germany, whether, you know, the not too many left over from World War II, but certainly Syrians that they find in Germany that may be accused. So Germany is, is, is truly, you know, putting their money where their mouth is, so to speak, when you look at that and, and looking at war crimes prosecutions. And, uh, and just one thing I might 
encourage you, next Thursday and Friday, the Nuremberg Principals Academy is having a webinar. Go to their website, and it's on the 75th anniversary of the verdict in Nuremberg on the 75th anniversary of the verdict of the IMT next Thursday and Friday, where you're going to have a number of former and all the current prosecutors of international tribunals participating in that webinar. Great. Well, thanks. On that note, um, help me uh, thank our panelists for a terrific panel. Thank you.